Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Sunny Hanala. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Human Anatomy and Cell Science at the University of Manitoba. And I'm also the Director of Outreach for the Manitoba Neuroscience Network, the nonprofit organization that represents neuroscience researchers here in the province. Welcome to tonight's Café Scientifique. These cafes are an initiative of the Office of the Vice President, Research and International at the University of Manitoba. For the last five years, we at the Manitoba Neuroscience Network have partnered with the Office of the Vice President for one cafe a year during Brain Awareness Week, which is going on right now. We have a very topical subject for tonight's discussion, addictions and the brain. Our panel of scientists will discuss how their research is helping to learn how the brain is altered by addiction and how this information can be used to improve treatment. Uh, I would like to mention that one of our panelists, unfortunately, is not able to join us tonight due to unforeseen circumstances, but I'm sure that our moderator and panelists will be able to fill the gap and answer any questions that arise. So now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, who will tell you more about the panelists and some of the ground rules that will guide the discussion this evening. Dr. Junfen Wang received his PhD in neuroscience from Peking University in China. In case any of you don't know, Peking University is like the Harvard of China Sinus. <laughs> and he completed postdoctoral training in neuroscience at the University of California, San Francisco, and also at McMaster University. Dr. Wang held academic appointments at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto and the University of British Columbia before coming to the University of Manitoba in March 2012. Currently, he is an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics in the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. And Dr. Wang's research focuses on Alzheimer's disease and depression, specifically on the role of oxidative stress in the pathophysiology and treatment of these disorders. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jun Fen Wang. Thank you, Dr. Halina. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I will be your moderator for this uh, evening's uh, discussion. Um, this event will take one and a half hours from 7 to 8.30. Um, first, I will uh, give a quick overview of how we plan to proceed. So each of our panelists will speak for about 10 minutes um, for their uh, perspective on the topic of discussion. Um, after all panelists have spoken, I will open the floor up for discussion on question. Um, I will be passing the wireless the microphone so that everyone can hear your comment and questions. So this evening's panel um, presentation are being videotaped and recorded for later uploading um, on the Cafe Scientific website. A link to video will be posted on the umanitoba.ca slash cafe scientific website next week. Um, there, you see that there are refreshments on the side of the table, so, um, so, so please help yourself. And also remember there are some additional material on the side of the table, so if you are interested. Um, and also, there are evaluation forms on the chairs, and we ask that you will fill out this form before you leave in the end of the section. Uh, that brings me to tonight's two experts. So they are Dr. Every Knight, and second one is Dr. Matthew Kehoe. Um, and just now, Dr. Halina mentioned that we're supposed to have a Dr. Galeisner, um, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to attend this because of family issue. So he did send his sincere request. So first, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Matthew Kehoe. Matthew Kehoe is, is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Manitoba. He is a clinical psych, 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 psychologist and chair of addictions psychology section 
into the Canadian Psychological Association. His research focuses mainly on understanding and treating comorbid addiction and emotional struggles. In particular, he is currently leading a large-scale random, randomized controlled trial testing the effectiveness of a self-guarded online treatment for comorbid alcohol misuse and emotional problems such as depression and anxiety. Among young adults, many problems. Dr. Kehoe's clinical work is evidence-based, informed primarily by cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interview models of psychotherapy. Aside from his direct research and clinical work, Dr. Kehoe also has a passion for both mental health and advocacy and knowledge translation. Please welcome Dr. Kehoe. Wow, that's quite the introduction. Hopefully I live up to that. Um, thank you all for coming out. Um, as, uh, as our moderator said here, um, I'm a clinical psychologist uh, by training and I consider myself an addictions clinical psychologist because primarily I work with people who have issues with addiction, whether that's sort of at the early spectrum of risk or whether that's severe addiction. I work with the broad spectrum of severity. And one of the things that I learned about addiction is that it often doesn't come by itself. So um, I did some really important work at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health um, on an integrated care pathway uh, for folks that were struggling with alcohol use disorder as well as major depression. And one thing I learned there was essentially my definition of addiction, which is, you know, we, we need maybe months to actually agree on a definition of addiction. But if I were to define it, I would actually define addiction as an overlearned behavior, okay? So I want to focus on the learning piece here. So if you can think about Let's, let's imagine for a second that we, we haven't had any prior experience with alcohol. Okay? And so then you, ha you see a drink on the table. What's the likelihood that that might induce craving or you might be motivated to drink that? Right? Might be, might be pretty zero, right? Because you've had no experience with alcohol in your life. And so alcohol and substance, substances in general only gain a motivational value when you've had experience with them. Right? So the people that I work with oftentimes is their motivation to use alcohol really is derived from um, their inability to cope with the daily stressors of life. Depression, anxiety, life transitions. And so my definition of addiction is essentially you need to have experience with a given substance like alcohol and then that gives you the motivation to continue to use it. And the more that you use it, the more you become reliant on it, and the more you become at risk for being dependent on it or using it very heavily, okay? And then you start experiencing problems in your life. And so, in my work, that's the way I approach addiction, is that some learning has happened here. People are using for a given outcome, so then they become even more motivated to keep using. And so how can we get folks to understand that process and how it's basically uh, manifested in their lives, and then how can we get them to unlearn some of these patterns? Right? So, my alcohol example, if you were naive, you wouldn't have any associations with alcohol, but the more you use it, and let's say you use it for coping reasons, that's your association, and we know from, we're talking about the brain at least a little bit here, and as a clinical psychologist I might, I might do some of that reasonably well, but I'll leave that to Aaron to talk about the brain and the biology stuff. But essentially my understanding is that what we know from the brain-based literature is that it really does support that. So with alcohol, with chronic alcohol and drug use, basically hijacks the reward systems in your brain, right? So that the substance gains a motivational value for you, but also anything associated with that substance also gains motivational value. So let's say you're a person that drinks to cope. Right? And let's say you're walking home from a stressful day and you just you took a new route, for example, 
and you find yourself passing the Liquor Mart. The Liquor Mart has some pretty strong associations, right? If you've learned that alcohol helps you cope. So then you just find yourself at home and you've purchased all this alcohol and, and maybe you're a couple drinks in. It seems automatic, right? So that's what I'm talking about in that addiction really becomes an automatic learn behavior over time. And people aren't just doing it because they necessarily want to. It becomes something that's automatic and you might realize after the fact that that's maybe something that you want to change or uh, maybe it doesn't fit with who you think you are. So I think that's really all I have to say other than uh, the topic of this Café Scientifique is why it's so difficult to overcome addiction, why it's so hard to quit. So we understand that from a brain-based perspective, that it really does hijack your brain and it makes you do automatic behaviors that, when you reflect on it, you, you may not feel totally comfortable, you may not view that as part of yourself, but you find yourself engaging in these kind of things because it's automatic. <coughs> um, and as a clinical psychologist, I just want to say again that part of what I do is just helping people to understand the process but also helping them to unlearn and form new positive habits. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pico. Uh, our second expert is Dr. Aaron Knight. Uh, Dr. Knight is an assistant professor in, in the Department of Psychiatry in the Randy Faculty of Health Sciences and a medical director of the Addictions Program at the Health Sciences Center. She is a family physician and a certified addiction physician. Following medical school at the University of Manitoba and a residency in the Aboriginal Family Medicine Program at the University of British Columbia, she completed a one-year American Board of Addiction Medicine accredited fellowship at St. Paul Hospital in Vancouver. Since the return to Manitoba in 2016, she has been practicing family medicine at the Aboriginal Health and Wellness Center and Addiction Medicine at the Health Science Center. She also provides opiate agonist treatment in Opaskaya Cree Nation. In addition to these clinical roles, she has acting as a consultant to College of Physicians and Surgeons of Manitoba regarding safe prescribing practices and sitting as the Manitoba and Saskatchewan representative on the Addiction Medicine Program Committee. She is keenly interested in contributing to evidence-based program development, expansion, of service and delivery of high quality medical education for addiction in Manitoba. Please welcome Dr. Knight. Thanks very much. Um, so as, as was in, uh, said in my introduction, I'm a family doctor by training um, and I, after I completed my training in family medicine, I found that I was often um, seeing people who were struggling with substance use in my practice throughout my training, and I didn't have enough skills to be able to help deal with that. And so that led me to doing a, a one year uh, of additional training in addiction medicine um, before coming back to Manitoba, where I've been practicing since uh, I finished my training. Um, and so, um, I, I do a combination of family practice uh, at uh, a community-based practice um, at Aboriginal Health and Wellness, as well as a focused practice in addiction medicine, predominantly based out of the hospital. Um, so usually um, when people are admitted to hospital, um, but also some community-based practice with the launch of the Rapid Access to Addiction Medicine Clinics, as well as the work that I do up in Opasquia Cree Nation um, regarding opiate agonist therapy, so that's things like methadone and suboxone. Um, and so I see myself as um, engaging with addiction in, in three kind of separate ways. One, just as a 
as a person and as a community member where I see people who are struggling uh, with substance use disorder and addiction um, in my social circles. Um, I also see people in my family practice who may be using substances at a low, um, low risk kind of pattern of use. Some people who are using at a high risk pattern of use and may be at risk for substance use disorders. And then also some people who are struggling with substance use disorder and trying to engage with people and try and reduce their harm as much as I can from a family practice role. And then I also see people from my addiction medicine consultant kind of role where often people already have declared themselves as having struggles with addiction or, or um, substance use disorders and have presented to that higher level of care. I want to take back um, the discussion a little bit and just talk a little bit about the history of addiction care. And one of the things um, with addiction is that um, for a very long time, for years and years and years, it was understood really as a moral failing. It was understood as somebody didn't have enough strength to stop using or they had some kind of flaw in their character that led them to be using the substance that they were using um, and using it in that pattern that was destructive to themselves and to them around the people around them. Um, and in that same way, uh, addiction care was often done in, uh, so outside of kind of the professional realm, outside of the medical realm, where addiction treatment was provided by non-professionals predominantly and often by peers. So people who had struggled with addiction themselves and, and who uh, were either, were either um, at a place where they were doing better from their addiction and wanting to help other people, or maybe even still um, at some point along the spectrum of struggling with substance use. And what we've, um, what we've seen over time is that as we gain more understanding of um, substance use disorders and of some of the neurobiology and the pathophysiology of them, um, we are starting to uh, understand them and frame them more as chronic diseases. And that's where you're seeing people like me who have gone through medical training who then develop a specialty in, um, in substance use disorders. I do also want to talk briefly just about substance use in general. Um, I'm not going to ask for anybody to kind of raise hands or, or say anything, but the majority of the people in this room will have at some point used some kind of psychoactive substance. Um, and that might be a glass of wine with dinner, that might be um, that might be a cigarette when you were 13 because you were trying to fit in with the people around you, that might be a little bit of cocaine at a party when you were in your 20s, that might also be the coffee that helps you get up and get on with your day in the morning. Substance use is a normal and expected part of being human. Humans have used psychoactive substances for thousands and thousands of years. And the problem when we talk about addiction or about substance use disorders, which is the, the terminology that we use today, um, it's not about the substance use itself. It's about the destructive pattern of use and it's about the um, the substance use becoming that um, uncontrolled uh, and, and problematic use that is causing negative impacts on the person who's using and often on the people around them as well. And that, um, so the the negative outcomes associated with substance use is actually how we make the diagnosis today in, in medicine of a substance use disorder, which is um, our, our formal diagnosis of an addiction to a substance. Um, it is a combination of um, the physical symptoms associated with uh, um, chronic use of a substance. So those are things like physiologic symptoms to have the same effect as well as withdrawal, which means that your body has become so used to that substance that if you stop using it, you have a pattern of, um, of feelings as well as um, objective things that are happening as your body um, withdraws from that, from that substance. 
but also um, the, the large majority of the diagnostic criteria, things we look at to, to say whether or not somebody has a substance use disorder, are actually the impacts that are being had on that person's life. So that's not coping with, um, that's things like um, not being able to c complete um, their responsibilities, so that might be family responsibilities, that might be work responsibilities, that might even be just isolating from things that were really important to them previously. Um, and other um, things like um, a, um, the compulsive use, so things like cravings, trying to cut down, not being able to cut down, um, using substances in situations that are um, that are dangerous uh, to the person's use. Um, so that might be things like driving after um, using a substance, so driving intoxicated. It might be uh, things like high-risk um, activities that people engage in when they're using substances. So that could be things like um, like sharing of in, uh, injection paraphernalia if they're using injection drugs. It could be unsafe sexual practices when they're using. Um, but really the focus is um, what are the impacts on that person's life? Because that's what we care about. Um, I'm gonna take a peek at my notes here for a second. So I'm going to go back to that idea of that um, just hijacking of the brain, just so that I can... Um, I, I was going to rely on the neuroscientist who was supposed to be here to tell you about all of the, um, all of the details about um, how the brain works, but the basic pathway that is involved in addiction is, um, it is called the mesolimbic pathway in the brain. Mesolimbic. Um, and you don't really need to know all these things, but there's two main parts of the brain that are really important in that pathway. One is the ventral tegmental area that's in the midbrain, and one is called the nucleus accumbens. And what happens when any psychoactive substance is used is the neurons that are in that ventral tegmental area either release more dopamine or stop uptaking the dopamine as much so that there is more total dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is the reward sensor in the brain. And so when, when it is exposed to high levels of dopamine, that tells your brain, I like this. This is valuable, I want more of this. It's the same pathway that is what tells us to eat. It, it's what tells us to have sex so that we have babies so that our species survives. Um, but what happens in uh, substance use disorders is that that reward pathway gets hijacked. And so when you uh, expose um, the brain to a psychoactive substance like nicotine or alcohol or cannabis or opiates or uh, cocaine or crystal meth, the release of dopamine in that nucleus accumbens is higher than those natural reward pathways. And if you continue to expose, um, if the person continues to be exposed to that substance over time, over and over and over again, the brain becomes used to have that higher release of dopamine in the nucleus cumbens, and it becomes less happy with the dopamine that's released with the other important things in life. And so with that ongoing cycle of repeated exposure, the value of that substance that releases the higher amount of dopamine becomes higher and higher and higher. We call that salience. And the value, the relative value of those other super important things in life, of eating, of having a good conversation with your partner, of hugging your daughter, relatively go down. And so this person ends up in a, a situation where their brain is saying, I need that higher hit of dopamine. And that's where the cravings and the, um, um, what my colleague mentioned in terms of your previous learning of uh, the things that are associated with that substance, 
become um, triggers for, for that person to use. And so by the time that somebody has a substance use disorder, it's no longer a decision that, you know what, I feel like having a glass of wine. It is, my brain is telling me that this is what I need because I need to survive. And so as we've learned about this, we've um, developed some, um, there's people like me now who, who develop some expertise in this. There are um, medications that we target towards uh, interfering in this, um, in this hijacked pathway. There are also um, psychotherapeutic um, strategies, some counseling techniques that are designed towards relearning the pathways, um, relearning the no normal coping strategies, and um, dealing with the cravings that come up in this situation with this hijacked reward pathway in the brain. Um, and we're seeing uh, an expansion of training of physicians and counselors who are um, taking this on as a, 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 an ex a, um, as a topic of expertise and trying to help people um, to kind of retrain their brain. Um, and that was a lot of talk about kind of neurotransmitters and pathways, but I think it's a really important thing to just get a um, little glimpse of in terms of that hijacking of that pathway, um, because that's one of the ways that um, it's really important to understand that that's what we're dealing with, is this automatic pathway in the brain that we need to be able to provide some understanding to the person who is struggling with it and to the people who are surrounding that person so that we can help them to um, essentially retrain their brain. Okay, thank you, Dr. Knight. Uh, now, I would like to open up the floor for the comment and the question from the audience. Um, and if you want to get up um, and help yourself to the refreshment, please do. Um, I will be the a roaming microphone holder to uh, so that we can hear your comment and uh, questions. So e you can either direct uh, direct your question to one of our experts um, or just uh, to anyone in general on the panel and we will do our best to give an answer. <coughs> question is for either of you. If all human beings are, if, if alcohol or other drugs, uh, uh, sorry, um, affect the brain physiologically the same, why is it that some of us can use alcohol, including to excess, or drugs, including to excess at times, and not become addicted, and others are? I'm not sure I understand that. <laughs> okay. So, um, when we talk about the, the neural response to substances, it, it's one little piece of the puzzle. So one of the things with substance use disorder um, or addiction that we understand in this new kind of biomedical framing of addiction it is that we understand it in kind of a biopsychosocial model. That means there are biological components there are psychological components and there are social components as well as spiritual components to both the development and the treatment of substance use disorders. And so there are, um, like any other chronic disease, I always like to compare substance use disorders actually to diabetes. So um, just like diabetes or heart disease or any other chronic disease, substance use disorders have risk factors that increase your risk of having a, a, a substance use disorder, and there's protective factors that decrease your risk of having a substance use disorder. So you're exactly right. Two people can be exposed to the exact same substances um, throughout their lives in the exact same way, and one person may develop a substance use disorder and one person may not. Um, there's likely some, some genetic component to it, likely. Um, in certain substances, there seems to be more of that than others. There is um, certainly one of the things that we've, um, that has been closely associated with uh, 
development of substance use disorders later on in life is adverse childhood events. So there was a large study of, it's called the ACEs study, where any kind of um, major stressors in childhood increase somebody's risk of developing a substance use disorder later in life. Um, and then there are things like, um, like personality traits and coping mechanisms that impact people's uh, risk of developing a substance use disorder as well. So when I talk about the, the brain pathway, and that that's a very simplified version of it, there's a lot of other things that are um, involved in a person's risk of developing a substance use disorder as well. For sure, and I, I think that was well said. And I think it's a complicated thing that we don't necessarily understand. You know, if we have two people in front of us and we know that we know a bit about their histories, it's often hard to predict who might use a substance problematically so encountering those problems uh, versus not. Um, but I do want to emphasize here that at least the case with alcohol work, which is the majority of my research is on alcohol, um, there's some pretty important physiological effects that are sort of linked to family history of alcoholism. So I was talking a lot about coping pathways, but one of the things that um, I and my colleagues have shown in the lab is that one of the properties of alcohol is it dampens your stress response, right? So you're about to go into a stressful experience and if you have a drink beforehand, you'll show a, a less of a stress response in your body as well as in your mind than um, somebody who maybe didn't drink. And what we see is that individuals who have at least uh, some kind of family history for alcohol use, they'll show a stronger stress response dampening to alcohol, which is rewarding, right? It takes the edge off physiologically and psychologically. So um, I just want to emphasize that at least with alcohol, there's a strong family history loading, and that does impact your ability to respond to stressors, and that is related to how, how alcohol impacts you physiologically and psycho psychologically. So it's not um, it's not a one to one. You have a family history. There's lots of people who have family history risk. Uh, for alcoholism, and then they ultimately don't drink problematically. But I do want to note that family history is a pretty strong predictor, as well as not being able to cope well with stressors and having certain personality characteristics that make that difficult as well. Um, let's say you're prone to depression and anxiety. Those are pretty big predictors. Um, yeah. Are there differences physiologically and psychologically between, say, substance abuse and eating disorder, say overeating, or, or, or are, they, are they distinctly different? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question, and honestly, people are debating this very issue. Um, and I don't know, you guys have probably heard this, that now everything is being, essentially, if people are doing it to excess, people are calling it an addiction. So, um, we do recognize binge eating as an issue, so eating luck large amounts of food, not being able to control that behavior. So one of the key features of addiction is not being able to control the behavior, right? And I would say that it does share some of those characteristics with addictions like alcohol, like cannabis, like some other um, sort of hardcore drugs. Um, and I do think it shares, but I don't know, and, and it does share some brain circuitry, right? As, as my colleague said here, it does share brain circuitry. Um, but yeah, I just want to acknowledge that there's a debate, but I do consider if something becomes at a level where it's difficult to control, do we want to call it an addiction? Not quite sure, but it is definitely a disorder that leads to problems, and some of, this, some of the problems are similar to substance addiction. I can just add to that, um, in terms of medical diagnoses of, of addictions. Um, we are, our current kind of <coughs> reference is the DSM-5 for uh, diagnoses. Um, and in terms of process addictions, which is what you're um, kind of talking about is more um, the uh, addictions to activities. Um, the two that are currently firm diagnoses in the, in the DSM-5 are um, gambling disorder, so gambling use disorder is one, and uh, the most recent one that's been added is internet use disorder. Um, um, 
and that's been more in terms of um, increasing the research that's going on into it. Um, right now, binge eating is not a formal diagnosis, but it's something where there's lots of uh, research that's going into it right now. My question is sort of about treatment. So <clears throat> I happen to know quite a few people who have adult children who are on this cycle of um, trying to stop a drug habit. Some it's meth, some it's cocaine, it's a real mixture. And just what I've observed is that it doesn't seem to be, like you can't have treatment once and seemingly repair those situations. Like that the, it's really difficult. And would that be true or is it just something that I've seen? Like do people get well with just one course of treatment or is that common? I think it's hard to generalize that. Um, when we look at the whole population of people who have had problematic substance use, the large majority of people actually get better without ever accessing formal treatment. And so um, we, we in the treatment realm actually don't see the large majority of people. Um, that said, the way that I like to frame addiction and substance use with, um, with patients and with families is in that looking at it like a chronic disease. And so that does mean that it is something where sometimes people are going to have periods of relative stability and they're not going to need to engage in really intensive treatment at all. They're doing really well and they might have periods later on of instability where you need to increase the um, intensity of the treatment and so that might be returning to, for example, a residential treatment facility or stepping up some counseling sessions or if there is a medication involved to help uh, treat some of the cravings, um, depending on the substance, maybe resuming that medication for a period of time and just keeping the dialogue open in terms of recognizing that even if um, you've had a period of, of abstinence and are happy with where you are right now, the risk exists of going back to that um, that previously learned pattern of use. Um, and so for a lot of people that it, it is um, a disease that requires a variety of different treatments over time. Hello, thank you. Um, I, uh, a comment and a question. I'm a dietitian who's worked in eating disorders for around eight years. I'm no longer there, I'm in research now, but anywho, I appreciated your response regarding uh, binge eating and addiction and your carefulness around that. You know, there is lots of debate going on. Um, and what I've heard it compared to is uh, sex addiction that, you know, sex and food have been talked about as you know, being necessary for life, and so how can we be addicted to them? So, um, of course, one might say we don't need cookies to live. Um, <laughs> cookies are lovely. Um, however, it's that relationship to food and sex that, um, in my practice, along with a, team, a treatment team and uh, other professionals uh, working with a person and group and individual, uh, that we helped people work through their relationship to food and, and talk about that, what you were saying about those learned uh, behaviors uh, around that. So, so that's my comment, so thank you uh, for letting me share that. And secondly, um, you know, certainly binge drinking is a problem and uh, we haven't touched on it yet today. But my question is, in regards to binge drinking, you know, we see it with friends, family, and they don't see it as a problem because it's just on the weekend. However, it does impact their life, put them and others at risk. And what's the social and physical aspect of how binge uh, drinking works and, and, and how might, uh, you know, a family member help uh, someone through, through that? Thank you.
Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. <clears throat> and oftentimes, you know, I, like I said, I, I worked at CAMH for about a year, primarily treating people who had issues with alcohol. But you'd be surprised um, how many of them come in simply saying, my wife told me to come here. I don't, I find I don't have a problem. Sure, like anybody else, I drink, you know, a two, four on the weekend, and things are okay, right? So it often takes a lot of work to, first of all, to get them to realize that it's having, having an impact on their life. And I think in general, the advice that I give to sort of family members is basically keep being supportive, right? Keep being supportive and maybe eventually, maybe eventually they're drinking or you never really know what gets people to shift in their mindset, but it's always good to have family around you who are supportive, who are expressing care and concern for you. And if that's enough to get you to get on the subway, go downtown in Toronto, see this guy who's asking you questions about your life, then chances are there's a little piece in there where you feel like you have some kind of issue. And then as a clinical psychologist, there's this really great literature, and I'd encourage everyone here to, to read on it. It's called Motivational Interviewing. You probably know all about that. And it's about getting people who are basically saying, I don't need to change at all, to get into a stage where they're now making changes, they're changing their environment, they're not drinking anymore. It's, motivation is really powerful, and the way that you interact therapeutically can make a tremendous impact on somebody's ability and self-confidence to change. So that would be my response to that question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, one of the things that we know, again, when we look at kind of the population of people who use substances, is that the largest proportion of um, presentations to healthcare and the largest kind of impacts um, from substance use in our societies are actually for people who don't have a substance use disorder. They just have high risk substance use. And so that's what you're describing um, is a, a binge pattern of, of substance use. And it may be um, that somebody who uses alcohol, for example, in that binge pattern on weekends, um, it may be that they do have a substance use disorder when you kind of break it down and see how it's impacting their life. It may also be that they don't have a substance use disorder and they, they simply fall into this category of high risk alcohol use. Um, we do have Canadian recommendations for lower risk drinking um, that came out, I don't remember when now, but they've been out for a while um, that you can, you can Google and look up. There are some really good handouts on the lower risk um, Canada um, alcohol use guidelines. Um, that recommend kind of a, a maximum uh, daily use of alcohol as well as weekly use of alcohol for, for women and men. Um, that are um, tools that we often use in family practice uh, when we're screening for uh, problematic substance use to um, try and identify people who are using in those higher risk levels and employ things like motivational interviewing and brief interventions to help move people along that spectrum and try and reduce their risk. Um, and so um, I agree with all of, um, all of what was already said in terms of just being a support to the people around you who you think um, are maybe using substances that are um, impacting them in a way that they're not quite realizing and um, hopefully that person also has access to something like, um, like a family doctor who's doing some of that screening and some of that brief intervention as well. Hi, um, I kind of have a three-part question, if that's okay. <laughs> um, when I look at addictions, um, sometimes a lot of the research will speak to addictions being an adaptive response to things like poverty, trauma, uh, marginalization, stuff like that. And a lot of what I heard you speak about was more of an individual focus, which may be the actual focus of your research. So. I guess what I'm looking at is, have you done any type of research on looking at some of the structures that are put in place that lead to things like social exclusion, where, I mean, if you just think about drinking itself, how many people have a drink just to fit in? 
that's on a small scale, but I'm talking on a larger scale when we look at things like people, our marginalized communities and looking at um, the impact of their addictions and where that comes from. Um, I'm just sort of wondering if that's my sort of first part, um, if that was any part of your research. My second part is um, what your thoughts are on some of the stuff going on in BC, particularly like Plain Amel and um, Vancouver with regards to the four pillars approach to dealing with addictions. And then my third question is um, if um, looking at the social determinants of health and how that is a piece around addictions. So I think your first and your third kind of questions are kind of, are interrelated. Um, we we haven't really talked uh, about that today. Um, the I, I think in some ways I alluded to it in some of the things like um, the the adverse childhood events of growing up in poverty, for example, um, or being in. Um, being in a situation where you're moving from home to home would certainly be adverse childhood events that uh, that uh, increase the risk of, of substance use disorder later in life. Um, I, I'm not a researcher, so I can't speak to um, any research that I myself are, am involved in. I'm really more involved in um, kind of program development and clinical provision of services. Um, so I'm going to pass that one along to my colleague and see what he thinks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to comment on that. And, you know, I, I kind of want to shift the focus a little bit um, on some work that I'm doing with a colleague that I have in Quebec. And so, one of the things that you see in this literature, the childhood literature, and the social determinants of health, is really a risk framework, right? So, what are the risk factors? Risk, risk, risk. And one of the, the good shifts that we're seeing, at least in that literature, is more of a focus on resilience factors. So the factors that actually protect against, let's say an individual is, is, is unfortunately in a situation where they're in poverty and what are some resilience factors that actually allow those people to not get engaged in substance use. And one of, one of the research projects that I'm, I'm involved with now is, um, so my my colleague actually collected data in two northern indigenous communities in Quebec. So children, so grades uh, 6 to 11. And really that project was about saying or changing the dialogue from risk to resilience. And, and one of the fundamental findings from that study is essentially, despite sort of, sort of systemic issues, societal issues in those communities, it was really those children that had a strong identification with their ancestral indigenous culture that actually didn't use substances, that actually didn't use alcohol, didn't use sort of other sort of harder core drugs. And it was because that identification with their ancestral culture was actually incongruent with having positive beliefs about any substance use. And so I, I wanted to make sure to talk about that research because I think it, I really want to advocate for sort of changing some of the dialogue around these types of issues, not to discount that these are strong risk factors for substance use, but rather how can we harness what's going well and use that moving forward in, in our models of substance use, but also in our treatments. Um, My question is uh, regarding the use of drugs for the relief of pain and uh, the risk of becoming addicted by taking drugs for pain. Can you, is it a serious risk? Um, I'm assuming that you're speaking mostly about opiate related pain medication. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's been um, a shift in our understanding about opiate, um, opioids for pain management. Um, I came on, I came into medicine kind of as the pendulum was swinging um, from one side, from one very far extreme to the other. And so in the 
1990s and early 2000s, we were using a lot of opioids for pain management, and we were, um, it was felt that there was no kind of upper limit for what we could use for opioids for pain management, and we should just keep increasing the dose, and it would help, um, it would continue to help. And we uh, got into this situation where we had a huge number of people who were on huge doses of opioid medications, and now we're a decade later, and we're seeing this opioid epidemic that has um, that has reared its head in in North America. And um, so Canada is just second to um, the U.S. in terms of total prescribing of opioids and in terms of the the deaths related to um, the opioid epidemic. Um, and certainly not everybody who uses opioids for pain management is going to have problems with uh, developing an opioid use disorder, so an addiction to those opioids. Everybody who uses opioids on a regular basis for pain management is going to have physiologic dependence to those opioids and tolerance to those opioids. So they are going to continue to have to creep up, likely, in terms of the how um, how much they use over time, and if they stop using it, they're going to have withdrawal. Um, the key in looking at um, the um, somebody who's been prescribed opioids for pain management for for a long time, um, and whether they have developed an opioid use disorder, is looking at all of those other impacts on their life. Um, and if they have that compulsive kind of use, if they're using more than they're supposed to and they're running out early and they're using for things other than the, um, other than the pain management they're using because of that warm, fuzzy feeling they give you and because it makes your life feel better. Um, and the literature kind of, um, it, it, there's a wide range in the reported literature in terms of how um, many people who are prescribed opioids for pain management will develop problems with it. It's um, sometimes reported as low as it's kind of 5% of people, 1 to 5%, sometimes as high as 25% of people. Um, and certainly as the dose of the opioid increases, the risk increases. Increases. And so that's one of the things that contributed to the more recent um, shift of using lower doses of opioid pain medications um, and trying to cap them at a maximum dose. And that's actually something that we've seen in Manitoba. So the, um, the College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, just a few months ago released new opioid prescribing standards for physicians. Um, so standards are different also from guidelines in they're not a recommendation, they're an expectation um, that um, we try and keep doses of opioids for pain management below um, a threshold. Um, and if we go above that threshold, we, we do a really good kind of risk assessment and have a really good discussion about why we're going above that. Um, so I don't have a super clear answer for you. There is a risk of developing a, a, an opioid use disorder, an opioid addiction for people who are prescribed opioids, it's probably somewhere in the realm of 10 to 25 percent. Thank you. I uh, enjoyed your presentation, first of all. Um, now, in the public eye and the media at the moment, there's a lot of discussion about crystal meth and the meth uh, epidemic or meth crisis. And I'd like to ask you two things. One is uh, how meth is different from other addictive substances. There seems to be more violence associated with it. There seems to be a lot of sexually transmitted diseases and increase associated with it. Uh, and uh, it seems to have a longer half-life, so treatment needs to be longer and it uh, is uh, different to manage in that respect. Uh, I'm also hearing that uh, predictions that we are going to have a significant upsurge uh, in meth problems uh, when the summer comes uh, in, uh, in Manitoba. And so the second question is, you know, how do we prevent that? What actions can be taken now to address this situation? <coughs> Good question, thank you. Um, 
So there's a couple of things in terms of why I think crystal meth is a little bit different from some of the other substances in terms of the impact that it has on people's lives as well as uh, the impact on treatment. You nailed one on the head, which is that the, the substance itself is a very long acting substance. So the half-life, so when somebody uses crystal meth, um, it tends to last somewhere between eight and 12, sometimes up to 16 hours. And so um, in comparison to the previous kind of um, uh, stimulant that was, that was heavily used, which was cocaine, and there was a, a period of time where crack cocaine was very, very heavily used, crack cocaine lasts about 45 minutes. And that same amount of, um, if somebody buys the same amount monetary-wise of crystal meth, it lasts 12 hours. And so it, um, that does a couple of things. One is that that period of intoxication lasts for longer. Um, and because that period of intoxication lasts for longer, if somebody becomes dependent on that substance, their withdrawal also lasts significantly longer. And so what we're seeing clinically is that um, people are having, um, are requiring some support in that withdrawal phase when they're having extremely high cravings um, and are extremely high risk of going back to using methamphetamine. And so they're having to be in supported places for a longer period of time. The second thing that is really different about crystal methamphetamine, um, or methamphetamine in general, is that when, I, when we talk about the dopamine response in the brain with different uh, substances, if we, if we talk about uh, dopamine release in terms of um, kind of percentage of normal, if, you, if 100 is normal and having sex is 200 and eating a good meal is 200-ish, um, alcohol is about 300, uh, cocaine's about 350, opiates are about 350 or 400, methamphetamine's about 1200. And so that reinforcing capacity of that actual substance itself is just so huge. Um, and one of the, one of the outcomes of that when people are in treatment for methamphetamine is that their brain has become so used to that high, high um, exposure to dopamine that remember when I was talking about the, um, the substance causing that higher dopamine level and all those other things that are usually really important becoming less important, that difference is so much greater when people are using methamphetamine. And so when they have um, stopped using and they're in that first few weeks and even months of not using methamphetamine, a lot of people that you'll talk to will describe this just general apathy with life. This everything feels gray and there's nothing that provides me any joy because of that decrease in that super therapeutic hit of dopamine that they've got so used to having with the methamphetamine. So those are the two, I think, main things from my perspective that make methamphetamine different. Um, um, the second question in terms of what do we do about it is a harder one, I think. Um, so this has been something that um, that people and systems have been grappling with um, significantly since we saw this increase in, in methamphetamine use. Um, you, you did mention also the increase in um, sexually transmitted infections that's associated. We're in the midst of a, um, of a syphilis outbreak, a huge syphilis outbreak in Winnipeg um, that is likely related to um, the injection drug use. So um, with methamphetamine, the large majority of people are, who are using meth in our communities right now are using it by injection. Um, and so we're seeing a, a, a large outbreak of, of um, um, skin uh, STBBIs, um, so sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. Um, the 
system, I can say, is, is just grappling with what to do with it. Um, a couple of things have happened already. Um, the non-medical detox in, in the city has increased the length of stay for people um, to try and support people who are coming through with methamphetamine. They've also increased the number of spaces that they have available. Um, we've had the launch of the Rapid Access to Addiction Medicine Clinic so that people can access um, oh, a addiction physician like myself as well as an addiction counselor on a drop-in basis and get connected to uh, care as, uh, in a way that is lower barrier than has been available before. Are those the solution? I don't think they're gonna fix it, but I think they're gonna be part of it. Um, and the other thing that is really important, I think, is things like this and just talking about substance use and, and uh, forums where we can talk about the risks um, of, uh, of substance use, try and uh, prevent some of the problematic use in the first place and make um, some of the stigma associated with substance use a bit lower so that people can more freely ask for support and ask for help um, from the people in their communities. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm interested in something that you said, uh, that is that addiction has biological and psychological and also spiritual components, a spiritual component. I'm just, when I heard that I was Wondering if you're familiar with Michael Pollan's latest book, um, Change Your Mind, what the new science of psychedelics is teaching us about uh, depression, addiction, mortality, transcendence. Uh, and he talks about, uh, in his book, about uh, psilocybin and LSD and how that's been used to successfully, very successfully treat uh, drug addiction. Harvard University, there's a research project going on there and other places as well. So I'm just wondering, uh, can you elaborate a bit about the spiritual component and, and, and whether or not uh, the, what I perceive as a huge increase in, in all kinds of drug use, if that doesn't reflect something about uh, a spiritual <laughs> something that's missing in our society, generally? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on how various sub substances sort of impact individuals in different ways. But what I do know is that the, that, that work that you spoke about with psilocybin, LSD, that's very promising work, and people are actually using it Kind of very low doses, even of ecstasy, very low doses, um, and they're showing some pretty profound therapeutic effects. But what I want to sort of, from my understanding, and, and maybe my colleague here can comment sort of medically on her understanding, but from my understanding, those types of substances, those very psychedelic, they're less gripping in terms of becoming dependent and abusing them, right? So you have these one off experiences where very profound. But it's not like you're doing that over and over again, right? So that experience kind of stands alone and you're satisfied for a while, right? These are what some of the, the, the clients tell me when I'm seeing them for, for using another substance. They'll say, I'll occasionally use psilocybin as a way to sort of stop doing that other thing as well because the experiences are so profound. So from my understanding, those types of drugs that give you those spiritual awakenings they don't really lead to, from, from what I've seen in, in my understanding, day-to-day uh, -day dependence and abuse issues. Yeah, certainly, um, certainly any substance use disorders related to those substances are very, very rare. Um, the, um, the psychedelic research that's happening right now is really exciting. Um, it's not something that is at the point where we can use it clinically right now, um, but there's some really promising work that's coming out, um, and um, some of it does comment on kind of the, the spiritual nature of the therapeutic relationship in those, um, in those sessions. Um, my comment on um, approaching addiction in that biopsychosocial spiritual model is that um, 
uh, I think the, the spiritual connection of people can be really, really important in terms of finding grounding and in finding meaning in their life. Um, and that might be something that they're not currently connected with, but might be really important with their, um, with their recovery and with their treatment. Um, and um, I, I can't speak to the kind of the spiritual, um, I, I, I'm just not aware of any research on um, the um, impact of spiritual connection with the risk of developing a substance use disorder, but certainly for some people it's a really important part of their um, therapeutic um, kind of uh, process in terms of dealing with the substance use disorder. Yes, good evening. I'm very glad I came. It's been one, it's been very educational. I just would like to clarify something. Um, you were saying that uh, genetics plays a, a big part in uh, people who uh, have alcoholism. And did I understand that if you came from a family, a large family, where alcoholism was perhaps in your grandfather and in your mother and then in a brother, but that also, as part of that, other members of the family might suffer from depression or from anxiety. Is that, instead of alcoholism, is that another component that they perhaps would um, have to struggle with rather than the alcohol? That's one thing. And the second thing is, I had, I'm a grandmother, have seven beautiful grandchildren, and a, some, one is already in university, and a couple more graduating this year from high school. Um, anxiety and depression has been there for a couple of them, um, and it seems to be running through the schools with so many young people taking their lives. Um, not being able to cope, and um, also the drugs that are given for anxiety and depression um, are, are rampant, like um, uh, Valium and, and Citalopram and things like that. So I just wanted to hear your comments on number my question first and this last part. Oh, okay, great. I'll handle the first part and you can have the medication piece. Um, the, so my comments around family history were just to acknowledge that we understand very well that there's a family history loading for alcohol. But the same could be said for things like depression and anxiety, right? There have been um, epidemiological studies, family history studies showing that there is a genetic loading to a degree for those emotional things as well. And I think you were speaking about and sort of an individual growing up in the context of family members struggling with alcoholism and I would say that depression is a likely response to that situation, right? Maybe they might feel hopeless to a degree, maybe they really want their father to overcome something which they think maybe from their perspective is simple, um, but from his perspective is quite complicated. And so for me, these emotional struggles are a response to environmental things that you grow up in. And so I think that it is very common for uh, you know, children of, say, parents who struggle with alcoholism to respond with depression and anxiety and maybe alcoholism. So I would say that those two things are related and both do have a genetic component. And to increase the complexity even more, maybe the person struggling with alcoholism is doing it because they feel depressed themselves. So there's kind of a double loading there. So that's what I would say to your first part. Um, I, I would agree with that. And one of the things um, that we know is that people who struggle with things like depression or anxiety have a higher risk of having a substance use disorder. And people who have a substance use disorder have a higher risk of having depression and anxiety. And so there's a lot of overlap between the, the populations um, who have one or the other. And oftentimes, it's part of um, our role in developing a treatment plan to, to try and address both. Um, 
And some of the reasons, some of the ways we may do that for both the substance use disorder and for the depression or the anxiety disorder may be um, psychotherapeutic based, they may be counseling based, but they may also be medication based. Um, the um, so depression and anxiety are, are two of the most common uh, mental health conditions that people struggle with in general in our population. Yeah, um, and well, certainly it, it, it's something that there are there are medications that can help with deal, uh, dealing with those. One of the medications that you did mention is the the Valium, the PAMs, all of the PAMs, um, were highly. Um, leaning away from using those medications for treatment of depression and anxiety these days because we know that they um, they actually only work for a very short period of time and then people very quickly develop tolerance to them and de develop uh, dependence on them and then it becomes very difficult to get people to stop using those. So a good deal of my time in my family practice is actually spent talking to people about those medications and very gradually decreasing them and trying to help get people off of them. Um, and that's something that is uh, newer in, in medicine where we're recognizing the long-term impacts from those medications and where we're trying to support people to come off of them uh, rather than using them as um, a coping mechanism for, for the anxiety. Um, the other class of medication that you mentioned was the, the SSRIs, so <clears throat> the, um, those are things like citalopram and sertraline and escitalopram, paroxetine. Um, and in terms of um, the best evidence for, for medications, those are considered first-line uh, therapy when we're looking at medications for treatment of both depressive disorders and anxiety disorders. Um, and um, they, when we look at their effectiveness, um, they are, a, for, for somebody with a moderate depressive disorder or moderate anxiety disorder, they're about as effective as doing cognitive behavioral therapy, so a structured uh, kind of interaction with a um, psychologist um, to work on coping strategies for depression or anxiety. Um, Unfortunately, in our system, we often don't have good access uh, for people to access the, that cognitive behavioral therapy. And though that results in us often using medications to, to treat those, um, those things. I do uh, bear clan in the north end, and with our office being open seven days a week, we have on the average 140 people come to our door every day. and. Uh, I, what you're talking about, I see that every time. All the drugs and, and what have you. We're doing the best we can, but we don't have any education in this regard. Um, just wondering, is, is there something out there that we could get in touch with so we can work with these people? Like you say, it's, it's an on average 140 people, so we've seen the, from the drugs to the depression, everything. Yeah, you're talking about, uh, can I just clarify with you before you walk away? <laughs> um, talking about whether there's somebody who could maybe provide some education for the Bear Clan staff to be yes. able to engage with people? Yes, Absolutely. Um, perhaps connect with me at the end and, and I can um, give you some information. Um, I, I can certainly connect with you about um, maybe arranging uh, a staff training session and I can connect you you to some other people as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great, and I'd also be happy to do that as well on the psychotherapy end. You know, what do you do? How do you speak to somebody when? I'm sure you guys are doing a fantastic job, but I'd be helpful. I, I'd be more than happy to, like to come that. and support you. We've got a, a new training session happening right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I worked at Mount Carmel Clinic for a very, very long time, and uh, we saw people on a daily basis who were who were high and or intoxicated when we when we saw them. And our struggle was always around how do I provide care for this person if they can't give informed consent? Now I'm retired, and I don't know if the thinking on that has shifted, but 
How do you remove barriers for people who are always presenting for health care in some state of intoxication of one kind or another? How do you how do you get their consent? Or is that still a concern? So I think informed consent I think informed consent is always something that should be um, on our minds. I think also though that um, we should be able to um, make a bit of a clinical decision in terms of the level of informed consent. So um, the level of informed consent for you to undergo a major surgery is probably different than the level of informed consent to um, take an antibiotic for the infection that you're coming in with. Um, and, and so there's some, there is some clinical judgment, I think, with that. Um, and there's also just meeting people where they're at and trying to provide them with the best care that they possibly can get from you on that, in that encounter. Um, and there's a, um, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of us, myself included, practice in kind of a harm reduction frame uh, where the idea is to meet people exactly where they're at and try and, um, a and, uh, engage with them on identifying what their goals are and try and help them to reduce the harms of whatever the behavior is that they're engaging with in whichever way that they can most successfully do that. Um, and sometimes that does mean that you'll do some things that wouldn't may maybe meet the same informed consent as somebody else coming through your door, um, but that's meeting that person where they are and where, where you're trying to do the things that they need you to do. May I ask one more question? Several people have asked questions about, um, or had concerns about, when you're living with a family member who is addicted. And how, how do you help family members who are constantly struggling with, is this help or is this enabling? And when do I save myself? And when do I save my child, father, sibling? And just, that's my question. It's a rare, really difficult balance, um, and so one of the things that um, we often work with families towards is understanding that you have to take care of yourself, and you can be there to support your loved one, um, but you can't necessarily make them do what it is that you want them to do. Um, and so sometimes that means saying that you're there, um, and, and that you'll be there if you if they want you to um, to. Uh, support them in making a step forward and maybe sometimes putting up boundaries where this is this is where my boundary is I will support you in way X Y and Z I will not do a B and C for sure and I would say uh, I agree with all of that but the best thing you can do if you're struggling and you're not sure if you're enabling or you're not sure what's going on you're stressed uh, because you're trying to care for somebody who um, is just gripped on a substance. So the best thing you can do is, is take care of yourself. So make sure that you get support for yourself. So whether that's seeing a, a, your family doctor, a therapist, whoever, social worker, I think it's important for you to get help because burnout is a huge thing among just caregiving in general. So oftentimes there's a caregiving role, right? Maybe it's your son or daughter. There's a clear caregiving role. So I think the best advice I would give is be supportive, but also make sure you're getting some kind of outside support for yourself, even if that's friendships, even if that's a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're supporting yourself. And there are some formal um, family programs through um, some peer support groups like Al-Anon, for example, and through um, things like the Addiction Foundation of Manitoba has a, a, a family program um, specifically developed to support um, loved ones who are, um, are involved with somebody who's struggling with substance use. Since we're doing double questions here, I've got a double question as well. <laughs> This gentleman over here spoke about Michael Pollan, and I follow him as well in the book, and heard him speak about psilocybin and its therape therapeutic uses. My understanding is they're in phase three trials. Can you briefly tell me about phase three, if you want me to know, what phase three trials are, how long they last? And I, I know that they exist in Vancouver and elsewhere. That's part one. Part two, cannabis is now legal in Canada, so you're, I'm surprised no one's asked a question about this yet, because it's a obviously a big deal in this country. 
And I learned recently, and I stand to be corrected, that cannabis has the same addictive rate um, as alcohol, which I believe is 10%. Oh, I stand to be corrected in all of that. And if that's true, um, are we going to have um, a problem with? The, I'm a cannabis user, so I'm not, you know, I'm not throwing stones at it. But are we going to have a problem with cannabis use? as we do with alcohol, because now that it's legal, and if it's true that it's 10% of uh, having an addictive quality, are we going to have a lot more addictive cannabis users? Phase three trials are um, essentially, they've gotten through the basic science trial, which is number one, phase number one. They've gotten through phase two, which is um, basically healthy people taking whatever it is that they're doing and it's not impacting them poorly. Phase three is then um, essentially, phase three is, yeah. yeah. Basically, uh, Here, let's talk to the uh, scientists. Yes. Basically has a I'm just twice. a doctor. <laughs> basically, Four trials, you talk about phase three. So before that, you have phase one. Phase one is a health basis uh, trial for safety issue for drug, a new drug. So based on the volunteers, health patient, health, health, health people. Second phase two trial is a, it's a small group. It's so efficacy. They analyze drug effective. So in a small group, phase one, phase two, both are small. Phase three is a large group. It's basically a company going to pay a lot of money for therapy. Not every drug can move to phase three. So phase three about thousand, thousand depends on what. The, How long? It depends. That's very long. If you pass the phase three, your bingo, you're going to drug are going to put on market. Phase four basically post market try. Just when drug put on market, it's still monitoring. You see some drug withdraw after you use on the. In the clinical still with them because some, some small minority group have some issue about that, like a safety issue, with safety issue. So phase three is five years, ten years. Oh, you really not good about like ten years, but uh, this depends. I guess a couple of years depends on how big patient, at least a thousand patient, depends how many patient and how company how much money for them. This is based for efficacy and safety both in a large group. Okay, uh, and I guess I'll just comment on the cannabis uh, point. I would say that what we know now is alcohol is still more widely used than cannabis. It still leads to devastating effects relative to cannabis. Um, so this is not to say that cannabis doesn't lead to a use disorder. I think back in the day there was this notion that cannabis didn't really result in, in addiction. But we have very clear evidence now that it does. So you can experience withdrawal from cannabis. You experience a wide variety of problems as a result of your cannabis use. And so I, it, it is acknowledged as a use disorder of DSM. Um, so I would say that we really don't know how the legalization will impact use here in Canada. So they were doing it for a while in the US, right? So we can learn some things from there. And I would say that it's really mixed. So maybe some of the initial impacts, the really the goal of legalization was to basically reduce underage use, right? So among adolescents. Um, in some states that happened, in others it didn't. And in fact, you're actually seeing some, some uh, effects where people are believing that because it's legalized, at least what we're learning from the US, because it's legalized, people are thinking that it's relatively harm free or benign, but I would say that um, there are risks associated with cannabis and as a psychologist um, I'm taking every opportunity possible to point out that there are actually lower risk guidelines for cannabis use. Have folks heard about that? No? Look it up. Lower risk, like we have for alcohol. There are lower risk guidelines for cannabis use. So harm reduction, judgment aside, if you're going to do cannabis there are basically 10 suggestions how to do it in a safe, not risk-free, but less risky way. So I'd encourage all of you to look up the lower risk guidelines, especially for those that have sort of um, adolescents or young adults where the cannabis use is kind of the highest it is among our population in Canada. Um, and just make those available and you can understand those, but definitely look them up.
I'll just add one additional comment to that. Um, so your, your stats are right. Um, it's about one in 10 people who use uh, cannabis on a regular basis will develop a cannabis use disorder. One of the things that I wanted to point out um, though is that that increases actually significantly if people start using on a daily basis in youth. And so um, if people start using before the age of 16, uh, the likelihood of developing a cannabis use disorder during some point in that person's life is about one in six. And so that's one of the reasons why um, the lower risk cannabis use guidelines suggest that people should delay cannabis use until uh, adulthood and ideally until after the mid 20s when brain development actually uh, is solidified. Okay, uh, now it's at 8.26 on. Next will be the final question. Hi, I just wanted to ask um, if you can elaborate a little bit more on the connection between cannabis and schizophrenia and psychosis. Sure. Um, so the, there's a, a couple of prongs to that. One is um, the cannabis we see today is not the cannabis we used to see in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and so if you look at the total um, THC content of, of kind of average THC content of cannabis today, we're kind of around the 20% range. Um, in the 60s, we were at about 3%, um, and it stayed pretty steady, about 3 4% in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and then increased pretty significantly since then, and it's been on a pretty steep curve. We're in that, like, somewhere between 15 and 25% range. Some strains as high as 30%. Um, and, and certainly some, um, some products that are even higher than that, um, that can, can be used. One of the things that we've seen with that increase in THC content over the years is that there's been an, also an increase in presentations to acute care because of cannabis. And so that's things like the emergency department due to um, acute intoxication, but also due to um, psychotic features. Um, and so um, I don't have I don't have numbers off of the top of my head to quote for you in terms of um, increases in presentations due to cannabis related psychosis, but I can tell you that in conversations with my colleagues in psychiatry, um, it's something that we see more commonly than we used to. Um, the one of the other. Um, uh, lower risk cannabis uh, use recommendations is that um, people who have either a personal history of psychotic features um, or who have a first degree relative uh, of uh, somebody who has had a psychotic um, presentation including schizophrenia, um, we recommend avoiding cannabis use because their, uh, their risk of developing psychosis is significantly higher. And just to piggyback off that, uh, one of the other uh, lower risk guidelines is to use cannabis that has low THC uh, levels so that you reduce your risk even further of those episodes. Okay, this uh, will end our tonight discussion. Uh, I would like to thank you all for coming tonight and for contributing to the discussion. So today's section is the last of our season. So watch our website um, and sign up for email notification located on the materials table to learn about the season lineup that will begin in September 28th uh, this year. Uh, and also please remember to fill out uh, evaluation and leave uh, on the chair. So thank you for joining this evening.